folks, this is Dan Hook from uh, Get Outdoors with Hook Outdoors, and I am pleased today to be joined by Mr. Kyle Sams uh, from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. He is a deer program biologist with the department, and uh, we're going to talk today just deer hunting, you know, uh, the harvest population, uh, and different things along those lines, decision making and so forth. So, uh, Kyle, glad to have you. And if you could give us just a little bit more background as far as your experience and stuff, we'll, uh, we'll go into some questions then. Okay. Yeah. Pleasure to be on here, Dan. Uh, I look, I look forward to these type of opportunities anytime I can get on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit quick about myself. You know, I graduated uh, right here in, uh, from Eastern Kentucky University right here in Kentucky. Um, I was born and raised in southeast southeast part of Kentucky, uh, probably in Pineville, if you guys have never heard of that. Um, so I was born there in the mountains and kind of know a lot of things about the mountains. And, and uh, uh, that's where I first started hunting. And uh, a little bit about my experience. You know, when I first graduated college, and even in college, I had taken some jobs uh, all around the country working with uh, servants. So any anybody in the deer family, so elk, mule deer, right. white-tailed deer, um, uh, and I've worked with some with bison and, and pronghorn antelope, and from Montana all the way to uh, Pennsylvania and into North Carolina. So I've mm-hmm. uh, got a lot of experience uh, with uh, with working with uh, cervids. Um, I even got a little bit of experience with bears and, and also with wild pigs. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a pretty fun ride. <laughs> all right, cool, cool, cool. And I think from your bio, you've been with a, you've been with the department how long now? I've been with the department for probably. Uh, in the in the role I am in now for five six years, mm-hmm. I started with, as a as a technician back in 2008, mm-hmm. um, working with the, the deer and elk program and, and and did that for four years, okay. um, and then I moved on to uh, to do some uh, environmental science work, mm-hmm. um, and then I come back to Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. Uh, back in 2015. All right, cool. Well, I guess just right off the bat, uh, what is, I guess, the status of the current population? Are the numbers up or down? Is the herd healthy? Uh, 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 where does the whitetail population stand at right now in Kentucky? Well, it, it, we use, so I guess that's a, uh, from a, from looking at it from a biologist point of view, there's, there's a lot in that question. I mean, we have a great herd in Kentucky, right? And uh, our population is 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 up and down in in in, in good numbers. I mean, it, it it fluctuates just like anything else does. But we we've roughly got about a million deer wow. statewide now. I've hit like six of them with my truck. So they're, you know, <laughs> yeah, you the, 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 you know, that happens every year. That's unfortunate. That's just part of having wild animals in the ecosystem. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, there's there's different things that happen that that that, that causes the po- population to fluctuate, mm-hmm. uh, but it's 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 definitely something that's hard to wrap your to get your, your hands around. I mean, we use a lot of different types of data to yeah. get the population numbers. I don't necessarily believe that the and this is not what they're intended for. So when when we talk about population models and things like that, mm-hmm. uh, those models uh, will spit out numbers. Right. And they're not really intended to tell you exactly how many deer are on the ground. Sure, yeah. That's that's a number that's impossible to get. I mean, sure. if you think about uh, in the human population, we do censuses every ten years, mm-hmm. and I mean it's it's just about impossible uh, to get everybody to say you know to be yeah. part of that census. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we use several different tools to uh, measure what's going on in a, in a specific county. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also use those models to kind of give us trend data to tell us, uh, what's going on overall. And, and we measured or we, we, uh, managed down to right. the, the county level. So right. we don't go any farther than that. And a lot of times we're looking at county information. There's a lot of counties out there that, um, that, uh, might, half the county might be really good habitat, but the other half won't be. So, Managing down to that county level, it gets tough in some of those counties, but uh, I think we do I still do a pretty good job in, oh, yeah. uh, of doing that. And, and when you think about managing deer statewide to the county level, it's never going to be mm-hmm. perfect. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's always, it's, I always, always describe it as a roller coaster. Right. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up and it goes down. <clears throat> and 
Uh, when it goes when it goes too high, then we liberalize, liberalize uh, the bag limits. When it starts to decline, we we restrict those bag limits. So it's it's kind of we're kind of playing catch up, and it's uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of keeping that pretty good everywhere everywhere in, in the state. Yeah. But I will say, go ahead. Oh no, that was just that was kind of one of the questions I had for today was just what you and what you're already jumped into is just uh, you know how the department uses that data mm-hmm. you know to make those zone changes and link the seasons and that sort of thing because like uh, where I am here on Cave Run Lake um, back in I was born in 1968 uh, my dad saw the first white-tailed deer here in uh, 1948. Uh, if that gives you any idea to the growth of the population. But yeah. I can remember back in the early 70s when uh, deer season was uh, three days. It came in on a Saturday and went out um, on Monday. And south, I guess southeast of here, there weren't, there weren't any seasons because we used to have an opening day here. This used to be crazy. There would be cars parked all up and down the road because, you know, we'd have guys come in here like you talked about being from southeastern Kentucky. I think I knew more people from uh, from Letcher and Harlan County uh, than I did in my own county when I was a kid because uh, uh, those guys uh, came around all the time. And, you know, just uh, that's just the thing for me, just not being on the – on the on the scientific end of it, like you are, uh, just the sheer numbers and you know the lengths of seasons and and the amount of deer that are harvested now versus you know 40 years ago. Yeah, it's it's a big difference. And I was, I mean, being from Southeast Kentucky, I was part of the the Southeast migrants that moved <laughs> to western part of the state. I mean, I killed my first deer uh, in Jones County Wildlife Management Area when I was mm-hmm. probably uh, 13 or 14 years old and. And I started I started squirrel hunting very early in life, but uh, was lucky enough to get my first deer down there. Man, that was uh, talking about a good story, but uh, that's kind of changed. I mean, in southeast Kentucky, our deer have we brought those back. We stopped uh, translocating deer mm-hmm. in 1999, I believe, right there, late 90s, early 2000s. So I should know that right off hand. Stop them. That's a natural <clears throat> herd now. Or, I mean, that's, yeah, that's we a don't. Mm-hmm. Herd. Yes, sir. And, and, and the thing though, to remember, I mean, when, when I was young, I can remember going out west and thinking, man, why don't we have this, these deer in southeast Kentucky? And I'm like, mm-hmm. why not? And it took me a few years to actually figure it out. Uh, I finally figured out that, you know, habitat is a, is a limiting factor in east Kentucky. I mean, you look at the bluegrass region of Kentucky, central Kentucky mm-hmm. area. I mean, that's our, that's where our highest deer numbers are in the sure. state by far. I mean, yeah. you're looking at, 60 to 120 deer per square mile in some counties, um, way, way too many deer. Uh, but our, in southeast Kentucky or east Kentucky, for that matter, are basically our zone three and four counties. Mm-hmm. They can never have that many deer just because, I mean, it's a primarily forested habitat. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately uh, for our deer hunters, um, when you have that type of habitat and you start throwing different types of method of, of, of harvest or not harvest, but death. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, there's not a lot of cover in those type no. of habitats. No. So when uh, fawns are trying to hide, I mean, it's a lot easier for coyotes, bobcats. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways for them to die. And I guess that's another question I have. Like, you know, I know the, in the recent years, everyone, uh, the big thing has been like the blue tongue and, mm-hmm. and all like that. Uh, has that been a had a big an effect on the herd as what you hear people talking about. I mean, I know, I guess it's had some effect, but uh, mm-hmm. has it been that drastic as you hear people talk? That's it's, it's yes and no. So, um, from 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 a, from my point of view, and 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 what the data tells me mm-hmm. is that for a county that was hit really hard with hemorrhagic disease or right. episodic hemorrhagic disease, a lot of people refer to it as blue tongue. Sure. They're definitely in the same family, uh, but uh, of viruses. <clears throat> they, um, uh, countywide, it's, it, well, it's not that big of a deal, countywide. Mm-hmm. When you throw all the deer that, that are in that county, that we think are in that county, mm-hmm. um, uh, it's, it's, it didn't affect them um significantly in that way now on the flip side locally 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So if you have a 100 acre or 300 acre farm, or if you hunt a wildlife management area down there, mm-hmm. and you've been hunting in the same area for a while, and um, you're not seeing any deer, uh, a lot of those deer could could have succumbed to hemorrhagic disease. And the way things work in the deer world, it's going to take some time to build those those deer back. So um, we don't really know how many died per say in uh, uh, of the actual numbers we got a lot of we got i think almost 5000 in between 4000 and 5000 reports in 2017 mm-hmm. and um that was a, a lot of deer that died several counties were hit very hard compared to some of the other ones right. but getting getting at what i was trying to say is is that so locally uh, you may not have any deer left in the places that you hunted mm-hmm. which is well, that really stinks for for hunters yeah. and it's yeah. and <clears throat> i mean if i could wave my magic wand and put those deer back um, I would, but uh, the the biology of deer and how they work when they re- are removed from that situation or removed from an area, mm-hmm. um, if bucks, the way buck movement um, works is, is uh, male deer will make excursions, especially when they're young, like a year and a half old. They will the mamas will kick them out, mm-hmm. and they will go they will go find a new place to live and and kind of call their home their home. Um, and, and they travel can travel long distances. I mean, some of them can go 20, 30 miles. Most of the time, it's 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 less than that. But they can take those big excursions. But on the female side of things, mm-hmm. there's there's the rose petal effect um, that female typically follow. So if you have a, a mama doe and she has a fawn, a, or two has a, a fawn, a male fawn and a female fawn, well, that male fawn at a certain age he gets kicked out and he goes off. Like I was saying. Well, that female will, she will inhabit that same general area and she will uh, move off uh, just to the side of her mom. Uh, and, a, and, and if you think of a rose petal, the mom being the center of the, of the rose and then the petal being a fawn or a, a, a female fawn, she kind of stays near. Even when she grows into an adult, she might run with mom or stay near mom. Um, and, and as she has, as, a, as, a, as the original mom has does uh, as fawns, they kind of, they kind of spread around her, and, and they don't really move that far most of the time. There are some does that take off and go long distances, but um, 99% of the time they don't move that far. Right. So when you ha- if you were to have a bunch of does um, get taken out by a hemorrhagic disease or something else, then you might have bucks in there, but if you don't have any females, right. then your population is not going to grow. Okay. So it just takes it's just going to take some time for those places in East Kentucky that were hit hard for HD, mm-hmm. hemorrhagic disease, um, to rebound. And unfortunately, another another <laughs> hammer in East Kentucky is uh, because of the habitat. There's just not a lot of forage mm-hmm. available to uh, cause those deer to proliferate. Mm-hmm. Um, like they would in, in the rest of the state. So like, for instance, in the central part of the state where you've got really good cover, really good forage, those deer, they rebound, they would rebound from this a whole heck of a lot yeah. quicker. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there'd be a, there, there, just like where we're at here, uh, there was a bigger difference like in Fleming County and Mason County than there would be in Round County and, uh, Morgan County as far as habitat and cover and forage and, and all that because you have more, just more open areas, more agriculture mm-hmm. uh, 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 areas, and that kind of thing. And you know, talking, uh, on, moving on from diseases. Uh, what about just a predator threat? Because you know, there's coyotes, and they seem to be on the. <clears throat> I don't know, but I mean, maybe you have more access to this information. But there seems to be more now than there were. Yeah, and I mean, uh, coyotes have been moving east for a long time, and. Mm-hmm. And it's hit or miss. They they mainly focus on um, small rodents, and, and and coyotes do eat a lot of uh, uh, herbaceous food. I mean that's mm-hmm. they they're they're on the wars, and just like we are. And, right. uh, but w- but when it comes to fawning, uh, they can do a number. And, yeah. and the way deer biology um, uh, is, is, deer are supposed to drop a lot of fawns at a relatively the same time, which is called the swamping effect. Mm-hmm. So basically. Um, the coyotes and predators, not just coyotes, but predators in general, um, just there's not enough of them to consume all of the fawn. So there's always some that make it through. In East Kentucky, where the population is not very good, the cover's not very good, it's easier to take those those fawns out. And 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 it just it's just another um, 
a, a slow slowing of the growth in white-tailed deer. Now, there's we did a research part project uh, back in 2014 through 16 in in Clay County, Kentucky, uh, and on on deer we were collaring does and collaring fawns, and uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we did we had most of our predation on those fawns that died of predation. Uh, was from a coyote. I think we had a few from bobcat. We didn't have any from bear. Right. Uh, but the bear are moving, uh, are moving, uh, substantially longer distances and, and they're, and they're definitely becoming more bear out there. We see them in this area now, uh, more and more. And, you know, I, I, I'm born and raised here and up until about two years ago, I, you, you never saw one. Just very rarely. And now, you know, they're a reasonably common occurrence, especially in the campgrounds and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, they are, and they're always um, bear are, are, are very. Uh, they're they're generalist, so they can they can adapt to a lot of situations. And sure. um, good thing for for deer. I mean, I'm, I I I don't. I've never documented or, or seen or know of a deer that's been. Uh, a deer farm that's been predated uh, by a bear, but I'm certain that it happens. I mean, it's, there's, I mean, it's just it's going to happen, but I just don't know how much it happens or if it happens a lot. Uh, that's just something we don't really we don't know right offhand, and we'd love to know this type of information, but uh, we would we need to we would need to do more uh, research projects down there in the southeast. Now, um, you know, going back where you know we was talking about forage and stuff and herd mm-hmm. rebound and stuff, <coughs> and you were talking about. You know, some counties are, are, are more suited than others. Um, mm-hmm. As far as just the, you know, your data from the harvest and stuff, um, the counties with the with your bigger harvest numbers, or and the second part of that, the counties that have, I guess, the the best quality bucks. You know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, for as far as quality goes, I mean, I can't really touch on quality that much simply because. Um, the only thing that we have to go off of quality is Boone and Crockett mm-hmm. submissions. So, sure, yeah. uh, Pope and Young, so yeah. there might be a whole lot of folks who kill a Booner, mm-hmm. uh, but just don't submit it. And, sure, yeah. uh, we get plenty of them every single year. I don't remember what we got last year, but we, mm-hmm. we can range from 30 to 70 a year. Mm-hmm. I, I know there's more than that, oh, but it's yeah. just, it's just, <laughs> um, but as far as Boone and Crockett bucks go, every county I think has had, a Boone, at least one Boone and Crock, Boone and Crockett entry uh, that we know that we know of, and and uh, so anywhere in Kentucky that you that deer hunting is available, mm-hmm. you're there's potential for a Booner. Yeah, I mean I'm from like I said I'm from Bell County, and, and I've seen the biggest deer I've ever seen with my own eyes come out of Bell County, and it and it was up on uh, towards uh, Harlan uh, there on, up on uh, one of the mine on WMAs there. We have to uh, uh, we have uh, an agreement with, and mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't kill him, but uh, I know a guy who did, and and uh, they worked with the mining company, and it was scored 196 inches. Dang, it's a really nice deer. Yeah. But uh, my point is, is that you can go anywhere in Kentucky and shoot a really nice deer uh, that make you happy. Numbers, though. Yeah. Uh, where, where 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 do you find your I guess your bigger harvest number? Is that more like central western Kentucky that way, I guess? Yes. So, uh, 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 so in Kentucky we have five regions. Mm -hmm. We have the Jackson Purchase region, which is far west Kentucky. We have the Green River region, which is kind of, um, uh, just east of the Jackson Purchase, kind of, uh, Lyon County through maybe Hardin, uh, Hardin County, and then basically from Tennessee to, to, to Ohio River. Then you've got, um, the Bluegrass region. Uh, then you've got northeast and then you've got southeast regions. So, uh, I'll throw, what I'll do is I'll throw out the top five counties. Uh, so in 2020, the top, the top ten or the top five counties of harvest. Now this is not broken out by females or males. I can do that for you just in a second. But, um, Hardin, which is Hardin County was number one. Mm-hmm. Number two was Christian County. Mm-hmm. Number three was Crittenden. Number four was Shelby. And number five was Breckenridge. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, but uh, I'm a, and not to confuse anybody, but I'm going to break it out a little bit further to kind of put it more pers- of a perspective. So when you're thinking about uh, just numbers, the best county uh, who has the highest harvest doesn't really tell you the truth because mm-hmm. you have to, every county is a different size. Right. So when you throw the, the 
square miles of habitat into the harvest, mm-hmm. uh, then you get a, and then every county is equal. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the top 10 in males by, uh, and I'll give you a deer per square mile of habitat, um, uh, deer harvested per square mile of habitat. So number one is going to be Pendleton County. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spencer is number two. Mm-hmm. Bracken is number three. Mm-hmm. Anderson is number four. Mm-hmm. And Crittenden County is number five. And that's male harvest. Right. Female harvest, Pendleton is still number one. Mm-hmm. Bracken County is number two. Spencer is number three. Mm-hmm. Crittenden County is number four. Right. And then a surprise for me was Gallatin County is number five in top in the top that rounds out the top five in the Gallatin. deer harvest per square mile. Mm-hmm. Huh. And those, if you'll notice, every one of those counties mm-hmm. are uh, the top five are in the except for Crittenden County um, are in the uh, bluegrass region, which is Central yeah. Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh, that's amazing. I, 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 I'm not surprised on one hand, but on the other hand, am I honestly? I, I thought there would be more Western Kentucky counties uh, uh, show up in that, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, in, in, in some of those counties, like if you depending on what you call them, Western Kentucky. So if you're talking farm country, mm-hmm. true farm country, then basically west of the lakes. Uh, land between the lakes, if you go west from there, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the deer harvest is much lower. It's more like a zone three or zone four. And, and mm-hmm. even though it's a zone one, mm-hmm. uh, and we can, we can talk about that if you like, but, uh, when you start moving east of the lakes, getting into that really good deer habitat where you've got some, um, agriculture, you've got some forests, you've got some rolling hills, mm-hmm. um, we've got a lot of different types of habitat, um, river bottoms and things like that. Right. Deer do a lot better. And those, a lot of those counties would be in the top 10. Um, for instance, like I'm just trying to think, Butler County uh, would be in there. If he's not, if they're not in top ten, they'd be in top fifteen. Uh, Hart County, Hopkins, mm-hmm. um, but in Graves County, it's another Western Kentucky county that would be in, uh, uh, in the top ten in terms of harvest, not really deer per square mile. Um, Green County, uh, but yeah, so you get the picture. But I mean, the difference between uh, so you, zone one counties. If you think about zone one counties, you think about uh, Central Kentucky, uh, a lot of those counties along the river are zone one. Mm-hmm. And then you get into western Kentucky, which is the purchase region, uh, the Jackson purchase region. A lot of those counties are zone one, but the deer habitat is really not there. I mean, you think about row crops and mm-hmm. I mean, the, the forage is there for, from basically May or maybe mid May all the way until harvest. But then after harvest, yeah. there's nothing there for them. So, uh, they're a zone one simply because there's not a good, there's not a good mix. Yeah, there's plenty yeah. of beans and corn during growing yep. season, but once the harvest is off, you know, versus say central east central mm-hmm. Kentucky where they have a uh, 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 you know a reasonable amount of woodland forage to go along to supplement their uh, uh, grain crops that they're exactly you know, right. I, 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 I get that. I've got always been curious about Fort Knox. I know different people that have, I guess they have some kind of a quota hunt down there. And I mean, I know mm-hmm. that's like a, a military base. Uh, mm-hmm. Do they let you guys in there to like uh, study those deer or, 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 no, or they um, their own deal? They're their own deal. I mean, they have to abide by the, the, the hunting restrictions that we, mm-hmm. that everybody else follows. They just have, it's basically a quota hunt and they get, they, they can, um, they allow, uh, a certain number of people to come on there and, and harvest those deer. And, um, it's a little bit different, but they, but we work really closely on one of the guys you used to work with us yeah. is, is over or two of the guys used to work with us, uh, is over, uh, over their wildlife program there. And, 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 uh, they give us uh, a tremendous amount of data that we, we can use for different, different things, disease data, right. uh, uh, harvest data, habitat stuff and, and so we work closely with them to get a lot of that stuff that we would need okay and i guess i've always been curious uh why do they start bow season so early uh well i mean that that was originally we started bow season earlier um i know it was back in i think october well back in the day before i even was a bow hunter i mean um that was it's been i couldn't even tell you when they when we started put it in september but basically um it, it was there because uh, our population was growing, and we okay. moved it back because we knew we could get some harvest in there. Um, a lot of people did not like it yeah. um, because they thought that you know, you know, you're killing bucks early or you're killing those does early. 
Um, or if you're mainly it was, it was it was because you're taking the bucks out of the population and they can't breed. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I understand their argument, but the argument on that one is uh, is uh, not that good because right. the buck isn't the only one who contributes to the, the those fawns sure, yeah. in terms of genetic, yeah. and and it can be argued that the the female um, contributes the contribution the female makes is far more important than what the male makes and. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can get into all that, the genetics and all that kind of stuff, but it, we were, we moved it back because, um, we wanted to opt- for the numbers and just give them a more opportunity. More opportunity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And we would never, we would never do anything that would be detrimental to our herd. If, it, if something were to, were to go, um, out of our control, or let's just say there, a lot of people just start picking up archery equipment or more people start picking up, um, our, uh, um, firearms to hunt deer, and it was just having a negative effect on our deer. We would change something some way somehow. Granted, it may take you a season to catch up, but sooner or later, yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. Would, you guys would uh, uh, get it back uh, back in the wheelhouse, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, it's go ahead. Oh, and I was just curious. Uh, I've always wondered, uh, from the biological standpoint, why do bucks always gather up in groups? Uh, prior to the rut i mean wh- wh- why is that well it's just it's just what they like to do i mean they mm-hmm. like to hang out with their buddies and mm-hmm. and, and and you'll notice that uh, bucks and does don't really congregate and it's the same it's the same it's the same behavior across multiple different species for instance like elk okay. yeah. for instance elk will do the same thing you will, i mean you find some cow elk uh on one mountain you not i mean you're not going to find a bull elk uh, close by. It might be the next ridge over or something. They don't usually hang out. It's just their behavior. Um, a lot of people like to make jokes and say, well, you wouldn't want to hang around women that long. But, uh, I don't know if it's that, but I think that it's, uh, it's just what they like to do. They like to learn from each other. Um, it's kind of, I mean, what I like to akin it to you in, in high school or grade school or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I hung out with, uh, some guys that are always maybe a year or two older than me and, mm-hmm. Uh, and when I got in upper and I I'd always kind of adopted a, a friend that was a year on, younger or two younger than me. And it just kind of seems like it's, it's, it translates well into learning how to do things and to survive. Hmm. How many different kinds of deer are there in Kentucky? I, mean, I know we got white tails, but are there other, other, I guess, I don't know if you'd say species. species. Uh, uh, are, are there just more than white tails here in Kentucky? No, sir. We have. Um, all we have cervids, so uh, if your listeners don't know what a cervid is, a cervid is just a member of the cervidae family. So anything that's deer species, like so elk, deer, right. caribou, moose, uh, reindeer, uh, mule deer, uh, those are all cervids. So the only cervids that we have in Kentucky, wild cervids, are white-tailed deer and Rocky Mountain elk. Really? I was just now curious. I didn't know if they might have had anything like down in western Kentucky where the climate's just a little different. I, I didn't know if they would have well, they there so there are there like so breeding populations and a big population so there's like uh, then at Lambton Lakes they have uh, fallow deer, mm-hmm. elk, um, and white-tailed deer. I believe they got white-tailed deer. Maybe not. Maybe it's just fallow and elk mm-hmm. um, in their bison prairies and things like that. Mm-hmm. Those guys are in a uh, captive. They're not they're not wild animals. They're in a captive setting. So they got a fence around them. They can't get out. Mm-hmm. And there's several of those across the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is. Um, if I remember correctly, there's, there is a couple fallow deer somewhere in the western central part of the state over near Louisville, or it might be sick of deer. I'm not thinking it's sick of deer. It used to be native to this, to this, uh, area? Or, no. Okay, I, I didn't know if there was some deer that, like that, like the elk used to be native and then they brought them back in and all that. I didn't know if there was. No, uh, all the, all the, the only species that were native here are whitetail. Mm-hmm. Um, and elk, mm-hmm. and the elk are kind of more of eco types, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, they think that uh, we think that they're more eco types, so they're very, they're very similar, uh, okay. and they change to their given uh, habitat. But but white tails have always been here, even though they got down to low numbers. All the other stuff has been brought in from other places. There, Tennessee has um, in, the, in the northeast part of Tennessee, there in the mountains. They had some red deer that got out and got out on the landscape, um, and and unfortunately for us, they those guys red deer or red stags can breed with elk. Uh, they cannot breed with whitetails. Different speed, they just different lineage. But uh, some of those, 
Yeah, which there, um, fortunately for me, I was I was able to, to shoot one one day. I was when I was a technician, mm-hmm. uh, I had heard that there was uh, they were going to have a hunt in Tennessee for the red deer, and I used to joke with my supervisor that I was going to ha- have me a pile of corn leaving from over in Tennessee in the, in the <laughs> South Bell County, and I was going to shoot me one. Yeah. Uh, long story short, I had a friend see it on trail camera, and then. Um, he would kind of give me a generalized location where it was at, but wouldn't tell me where it was at. And, and I was able to work him one day doing some elk surveys. I was able to see it and actually shoot it and remove it from the population before. But it was trying to breed our cow elk. It's, sure. it's a lot smaller. I mean, it was, he was about 350 pounds. Yeah. And he was a three year old, I believe. Right. Um, but anyway, it, it, they can and, and huh. they're close by. That could really monkey up the whole elk program. It could. It would take a long time, and and I don't know that those genetics would probably weed themselves out sure. uh, because the bull. I mean, the, he was so much smaller. Yeah. Um. And he. Could, I mean, it, it could be done, but uh, it's. Uh, yeah. We would. We regardless, we would not want that those genes okay. in the population. What is uh, what is barring it getting killed or eaten by something? What's the uh, typical lifespan of a deer how long should they live barring any outside factors you know the uh, normal lifespan well for does uh normal lifespan in the wild uh without any human involvement or anything like that and if uh, you're looking at predation uh if you take out predation shoot a doe could live to be 20 some years old uh, that's in, that's without any predation, a, a, a very easy life. Right, right. Um, but, but generally you start getting 14, 15, 16 years of age on a, on a doe and she's getting pretty, yeah, pretty high up there. to survive like the cold winters mm-hmm. and the, and the harsh elements and, and just, yeah. you know, get, keeping away from predators and that sort of thing. Do you guys yeah. have any idea the number as far as like, um, uh, just the average survival rate of fawns? Uh, survival rate, uh, you're looking at, uh, our survival rate will be somewhere, but depending on, on the, on the region, it could be somewhere between, um, 25 and, and, and one, 1.25, uh, fawn to doe ratio is what you're talking about. And, and one, 1.25 to per doe, uh, or, or even low, much lower than that. It just depends on, on what region you're talking about. I was just curious about that. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, as far as, you know, we were talking earlier about just the state of the population. And a couple of points I'm curious about is, you know, the harvest numbers compared to previous years mm-hmm. and just the overall, I guess, trajectory of the herd. Uh, 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 is it uh, just on a steady increase or is it spiking or is it just kind of like plateaued and, you know, running within a few thousand uh, 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 one way or another every year? Uh, you know, what, what's the, uh, yeah. where are we at with that? So, I mean, I can give you a general uh, uh, synopsis of, uh, of our past hunting season and if you would like, but uh, <clears throat> basically just overall harvest uh, and for the past uh, 10 years. I mean, basically in 2010, we started, we ended with about 110,000 mm-hmm. harvested animals. And this year we ended with 141,000. Okay. Um, 2015 was the highest year ever on record with 155,000, almost 156,000 harvested mm-hmm. deer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we took a dip, we, we've been above, we took a dip, a little bit of a dip, uh, in between 2015 and 2020. Yeah. Um, but we're, I mean, we're set, I mean, 2020 was the fifth highest on record ever. So, I mean, it's, it's much, it's a little bit lower, about 14 to 15,000 lower than 2015. Mm-hmm. But man, we were still setting, um, our records pretty good. And I mean, by the numbers, I mean, you think about what, what is, what is harvesting most of our deer. Mm-hmm. And it's by far, um, uh, modern gun season. We're harvesting between 70 and uh, 75%, um, of our, of our total harvest is by, uh, by the, by, the, the the modern gun season. I mean, um, you're looking at um, like 11 and 13 uh, percent, uh, uh, roughly of, of of vertical bow and, and crossbow harvests. Mm-hmm. Um, our crossbow is really taking off, which is is exactly what we wanted. And, right. And, and, I mean, uh, it's it's not equal statewide. Of course, um, most of the crossbow harvest occurs in Zone One. Mm-hmm. But I mean, just looking at, at crossbow stuff. Uh, 
uh, I mean, you know, we 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 increased uh, crossbow uh, season length in 2018. Right. Right. Um, for it was just about concurrent with with archery, but it's 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 two weeks uh, short um, because it starts two weeks later. But basically, in I mean, our numbers in vertical bow has has increased as well. I mean, we went um, uh, in 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 2020 we had sent about almost almost 18,000 deer harvested with a vertical bow. Right. But this year we had uh, just right right about 13,000 with a crossbow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a it's a lot more with crossbow, but pe- those same people that are hunting with archery equipment stay with the archery equipment. Mm-hmm. What's likely happening is that people that want to hunt with our archery equipment are buying that crossbow, and they're killing rather than killing their doe or harvesting their their deer in in that um, that uh, modern gun season. They might be doing it early. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing I'd like to mention uh, in our harvest in our harvest scheme is that the one key factor about harvesting deer uh, in Kentucky is the one thing that matters just about more than anything else in terms of if we harvest too many deer or some, in, in an area is our, overall our hunters only harvest 1.4 deer mm-hmm. a year. Right. And that's that's not changed in 20 years. So, yeah, yeah uh, it, I mean, the, the past three years it, it went from basically 1.3 to 1.4, and that's because we've we've given people more opportunity, which is what we want in those zone one counties. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, but overall, once someone kills a deer, mm-hmm. they're just they're not they're not really going to go back out and kill another one. Most, mm-hmm. I think it's about 70 percent or 75 percent of our hunters only kill one deer. And you know, I think a part of that is at least a lot of the guys I know, you know, they will pass on a lot of deer. Just because, you know, they they'll eat them as far as like that. They won't waste it. But but you know, if they know that there's a bigger buck in the area, you know, if they know there's a ten pointer, they'll pass on a six and eight. And, oh yeah. And I know I know mm-hmm. a lot of guys that do that, and they'll pass on does just to to get that bigger set of horns. And you know, I do know a few guys that you know they're going to kill the first thing that they see, but. The majority of the guys I know, they're they're out to have a picture, you know, and and, mm-hmm. and if they can kill something and have a picture and get something to eat, then that's just that much better. But yeah, I think that's a lot of it, you know. I, yeah, we have a buck wise, we have a really good age structure. I mean, mm-hmm. our hunters do a phenomenal job of mm-hmm. letting fawns. Sometimes, and when it comes to does, it's hard to pick those fawns out. Sure. But for bucks, I mean, fawns and then yearlings. Our hunters do a very good job of letting yearlings walk, mm-hmm. and 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 we have, and I think our one buck per year is, I mean, is just uh, when we put that in, that is amazing for us because when you look at all these other states that surround us, or in Tennessee, or even in the South, they've got multiple bucks per year, mm-hmm. and their quality is nowhere near ours, and they never will be because of that. And and, and you know, and that's what I was saying. They're you know they're holding out for that buck, so they're letting a lot of things. <laughs> pass them by just because they, they want that one big buck um what can i guess you know like private landowners you know i know a lot of people hunt public land but you know there's a lot of a lot of farmers and a lot of that kind of thing uh is there things that like uh, like i own a 170 acre farm in fleming county and, and i'm not talking about like you know baiting them and that kind of thing but just what are things that i can do on my farm mm-hmm. to encourage better uh, uh, herd health uh, management. I mean, shoot a bunch of coyotes, or, uh, or, 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 or or what's what's just some things that I can do as far as that goes. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, there's 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 so much to be done. I mean, in terms of food, uh, uh, specifically in Fleming County, you're starting to get into the uh, in some less quality. I mean, still good quality habitat, but compared to Central Kentucky. Uh, but look, I mean, so providing things like, for instance, like. Uh, 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 basically cutting a stump, uh, or so, so. So if you got a tree of like, for instance, a maple or mm-hmm. or black gum or or something that's less desirable than an oak, mm-hmm. um, you basically want to cut that thing down. Mm-hmm. And what you're doing is it's a mineral stump. So you cut it down and you don't spray it. Just cut it down about a foot or so off the ground. Um, and when that tree, and we're talking a mature tree, so not necessarily mature, but maybe 10, 15 year old tree, right. uh, maybe, uh, eight inches in diameter, uh, what you, you cut it down and what that tree's going to do in response is, um, it's going to 
put a lot of energy and nutrition um, into growing those shoots up again, and so it can survive. So, okay. so compared to the the tree that you just cut down, the the minerals and the nutrition in that that mineral stump um, will be will be off the charts, and they're going to devour that. So little things like that you can do. Um, you can plant. Uh, just, I mean, provide deer food all year long. So not just having, you know, a lot of hunters go out and put their corn out, which is fine. But if you want to provide them food source all year long, you want to have different things that are, uh, for instance, different types of clover. If you got cool, uh, cool season clovers mm-hmm. that mature early and late, that offers them a food, ser- a food source. And you've got things, warm season things that'll pop um, and be highly nutritious during the summer months and, and winter like, wheat. Like gardens. Yeah, <laughs> gardens work really well in the summer, unfortunately. But um, just different different types of things like that you can do. Um, uh, opening it up. So if you got a if you pr- predominantly have a forested system, and you wanted to open some uh, open let the sunlight hit the forest floor, having maybe uh, a timber cut, a select timber cut where you're pulling certain tree sizes or diameters out, and you're letting that sunlight hit the floor. Uh, then all the, the response and vegetation is going to be phenomenal. So from Deer. A, so from so. a wildlife management standpoint, you know, I ain't talking about tearing the woods all to pieces, but going in there and opening those woods up is mm-hmm. actually a, a good thing versus just not doing anything for 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 years on end. Yeah. So if, if we're just thinking about Eastern Kentucky in general, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, opening up a, a pocket of of, uh, of of forest to let light hit the ground and maintain that with different a food plot or whatever you want. Just open it up. The growth will be sufficient for deer to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, specifically in the first two to five years. Right. And talking about I mean, really thick stuff, mm-hmm. deer love it. Mm-hmm. Other things you can do is hinge cut small trees where you basically cut the tree down, but you're leaving a portion of it, like 10% or 15% of the tree still attached. Mm-hmm. Um, and you basically push it over. And then that tree basically... Um, provides nutrition because now the deer can reach the leaves instead of oh, if it's too tall. Okay, I've seen. I, I, I know what you're talking about. That's <clears> awesome. That's awesome. awesome. You mentioned, uh, you did mention uh, predators. So mm-hmm. killing predators um, at any point in the year is not really effective. Okay. What you want to do is uh, focus on the timing of the year. Uh-huh. So for coyotes and speci- specifically, um, you would want to focus killing those guys uh, just before and during fawning. What time of year is that? That's May and June. Okay. 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 So most people get out there and they hunt during the year and they kill fawns and think, well, yeah, I'm doing something for the deer herd. Um, and, and, and they, they might be doing it, but it's not going to be as impactful as they do if they kill them, uh, during uh, May, June when they're, when deer are fawning. Oh, okay. 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 Well, see, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. I, I, I had no idea that, the, that there were better times of year to, uh, do that. Well, that's pretty good stuff, man. Uh, but there's a whole other dynamic to the predator stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. think about when you killing the, the alpha coyotes, mm-hmm. the, the male and female, mm-hmm. and then what that causes <laughs> in return is basically instead of those, the rest of the, the, the coyotes stay in place and they disperse and they go in all directions. So, so if you can figure out who's the leader of the pack and kill him or her, then the rest of them are just kind of like lost and really don't know, uh, really well, don't know what they're doing. Kind of, but they can, they can, it, can, it can potentially make worse the situation. So <laughs> instead of having coyotes in one spot, you have them everywhere. Oh, yeah, I get that too. Okay. okay. So just some thoughts. All right. Well, this has been a pretty good, uh, pretty good deal, man. Uh, 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 I appreciate. It. There's been some awfully good information here. Uh, again, folks, this was uh, Kyle Sands. He's a deer biologist uh, with the uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And uh, Kyle, before we go here, is there uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add to uh, to what we've talked about here? Well, just uh, the final thought would be, you know. Uh, I really appreciate our hunters. I mean, mm-hmm. they are the, the management force. I mean, they're, they're, they're the biggest tool that I have in terms of managing deer. And, and without them doing what they do and give us the information that we get, we couldn't do it. And uh, uh, I'm thankful that our hunters continue to buy licenses so we sure. can fund conservation. It's, it's the best thing that we have going in this country. And, uh, and I absolutely love that our hunters are so passionate about what's going on, not just deer, with all of our species. Right. 
Right, right. Well, folks, so big shout out and thank you to those guys. Well, folks, you heard it. Now you just you get out there and you buy that hunting and fishing license, and and all that goes to uh, the forest and the lakes and the management of the wildlife and the fish and, and all the bad entails. And uh, Kyle, I just like again, I thank you for coming on, and uh, 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 we'll uh, we'll do this again uh, later on. Uh, uh, I read in your bio that you're in with the elk program too, and, and I literally know nothing about that so uh i'm curious uh, we'll do another show and we'll we'll talk about the elk and uh, and and how that came to be and and so forth that sounds good to me just let me know and i'll be more than happy to jump on with you i enjoyed it